pretty much everybody knows Pisa because of the Leaning Tower. But I think we should go see the Leaning Tower, but then I think we should go and look at some other things. city of Florence in northern Italy. On this trip I've been trying to propose a different narrative or a different itinerary to take within those towns like Florence, like Pisa, even just on a larger scale Tuscany and just try and find the places that have not been destroyed by tourism. And we're going to go to Pisa which you all know from the Leaning Tower obviously but we're going to go and see what there is to see there as well beyond the tower and then couple of days I'm going to spend exploring around the Tuscan countryside. This is the entrance line system for the Academia, the Place the gallery in which you can see uh, Michelangelo's David and certain other statues as well. Uh, I want to get in there just to get to the very, very epicenter of the tourist experience in Florence, just so that we can define that and then get out and away from it. So I've just had an espresso standing at the bar in Cafe Ricci here in Santa Spirito Square. Fantastic espresso as we should expect in Florence. Uh, it cost one, one euro twenty, which is a magnificent price in Florence because that's exactly what you would pay for an espresso in a local's bar in in Pisa or in Bologna or you know any standard little town so if you're not paying tourist prices at all if you come here to the Piazza Santo Spirito and there's nothing at all untouristy or undiscovered about the Piazzale Michelangelo up here in the high parts of Florence what we do have is this wonderful cast bronze version of David and uh, this is the third one that you could, I've seen today there's the original which is in the Academia gallery made out of carved out of marble and then in the Piazza Signorina there's the 19th century plaster cast copy that they put out there to preserve the original from getting damaged and then there's this one which was Michelangelo's own cast, his own bronze cast. He was involved in the making of this one. Fully bronze, a different setting, still just as majestic, still just as impressive. And it's free. That's worth coming up the hill for. I could do without the ABBA though. It's easy to miss the little rose garden between San Miniato Gardens and the Michelangelo Gardens on your way down but it's actually it's only a tiny little gate down there that you would quite easily walk past but do search it out. What I really want to do now is uh, get down to the city and I want to check out some of those wine windows. I think there are seven of them in the city that are still working. There are more than 120 of the actual wine windows built into these old houses, but a lot of them are deep, have been decommissioned over the years. But we'll just see if we can catch the one that I know actually still opens. 
I've got my glass of wine from the wine window here in Babae in the Oltrano Santo Spirito district of Florence. So. You'll smell them before you see them. Um, I'm at the baths, the natural thermal springs of Petriolo. It's a place where you can enjoy the naturally warm waters that are fed by very sulfuric volcanic water which comes from a volcano between here and Siena and it's free but look at all the beautiful uh, striations and patternings that the water that the water has made wow that's pretty that is a cold breeze a cool breeze just thing against the, against my shoulders and it really makes it a lovely experience because this part up here is cool but this part that's in the water is lovely and warm. I think what I like about it best is it's just so informal there's no uh, tickets kiosk there's no entrance times white streak on the mountains there that's actually the quarry this is all this stuff here that's down here this marble it's even they've even used it for the curb sides here for the curb sides here are beautiful Carrara marble and where else would you expect to find Carrara marble only here in Carrara you know this is still very much a working quarry they're still pulling the marble out of there at a fantastic rate and you know it's still very valuable stuff Michelangelo uh, was not the first to work on the piece of stone that eventually became David the two sculptors who had worked with it before him had actually abandoned the piece it was left in the uh, Duomo in the workshop in the in the Duomo of Florence for years before actually Michelangelo Michelangelo at the age of 29 said okay look I think I can work with this or he was given the chance to do so and he created that uh, statue of David the very the very famous statue of David there is a quote attributed to Michelangelo with that whether it's truly something he said or not is almost irrelevant because it's a beautiful statement about the creative work he said that it wasn't a case of sculpting Michelangelo or, or it wasn't a case of sculpting the statue of David what he said about it was the process was actually more a case of just cutting away all the bits of marble that weren't actually that were not actually David and I think it's a cool quote to have in your head when you look at the mountain about a mile in that direction is the next province which is Liguria we're still in Tuscany here we're in a part of Tuscany that I don't think many people go to because most of the time when people decide that they're going to go out in the countryside well you know there's a pretty set itinerary for Tuscany which is you start with Florence and then you move out to Poggibonzi and San Gimignano, um, Arezzo, Luca, all fine places all really worth seeing. All of them very well known, all of them you know pretty much blown at this stage in terms of secrecy they're not secret by any means but if you're coming for an untouristy visit to Tuscany I would suggest that you come up the opposite direction and when you get from Florence to Pisa start heading up northwards towards Massa towards Carrara when you get to Carrara turn inland and you start to get into the mountains here and you know these are some of the nicest mountains I've been anywhere it's unutterably beautiful I wish you could smell it there's a shell of pine and thyme uh, in the air which you know is every place has got its own specific smell and this one's got a very distinctive one it's beautiful uh, I've put on my sun cream you may see some of it streaked on my face apologies for that I've got a sun hat with me as well a bottle of water in my pocket and I'm gonna start yomping up to see can I get to a peak
and right down there you can see the quarries the same very same quarries from which the stone which became the marble which became Michelangelo's David was quarried from down there it's Carrara Carrara marble my gosh this is just magnificent Monte Borla haha <laughs> we made it Pretty much everybody knows Pisa because of the Leaning Tower, but I'm here to try and convince you that there is much more to see in Pisa. It's a delightful little town, a uh, little city really. The railway station is a really good orientation point because if you're in front of the railway station like this, pretty much everything you want to see in Pisa is in that direction right in front of me. There's a very obvious tourist trail which goes from this building here all the way up to the Leaning Tower. I think we should go see the Leaning Tower, but then I think we should go and look at some other things. Something worth knowing about this, the Piazza del Miracolo. To get into this general area, this whole complex, completely free and you can get up right close up to the three buildings that are in here and appreciate as much as you like. Probably wondering, well, you know, come on, Sean, reel it in a little bit. What do you like about it? What's the thing that you like best? Well, I'm going to bring it to show you because it's just a little detail on the doors, on the bronze cast door, on the bronze cast doors of the cathedral here. Don't you just love the rhinoceros? <laughs> I love the rhinoceros. This is Piazza Victoria Emanuel. You come straight, you come straight from the railway station and you can either continue right directly up the middle there, which is probably the, the big shopping street. That'll bring you directly to the River Arno, which then you cross to get over to the the tower eventually. But at this point you have two other choices. If you go right at this point. Now I'm not going to get too specific into the details because you know basically it's it's an area that I'm going to suggest to you that if you are hungry and if it's lunchtime particularly if it's lunchtime it's anywhere between midday and two o'clock in the afternoon that region's a really decent place to go and find the uh, the daily menu the menu del giorno, giorno um, which you find in some restaurants here but you won't find them in the touristy ones you'll only find them in the really local restaurants and that's the best region to go over and have a look for some of those again that's where you go for cheap lunch or an affordable lunch or a really good filling working lunch that street there Bogo Stretto is the, the main drag and then we're going to go left here to the Keith Herring mural it's 1989 Herring came over to Pisa to look around and see the sites the way most people do stayed for six months and while it was here while he was here completed this mural but don't miss it when you come here it's just so so close to the railway station and to the Piazza Victoria Emanuel what I want to do is I want to draw your attention to a a bar just behind me called Bar Leonardo and uh, Bar Leonardo is really worth knowing about because after six o'clock in the evening what they do is they put out an aperitivo buffet and you can just basically go and get yourself an Aperol Spritz or a Negroni or whatever cocktail you feel that you want to if you go and get yourself you know a good big solid meal during the middle of the day then all you really need in the evening is an aperitivo and a glass or something so Leonardo is a good spot to do it and now that we've seen the Keith Haring mural, I think we're just going to go into the mainstream and make our way up to the river. Right beside the Yves Rocher uh, cosmetics store there is a place called ARS. Just on the main street here coming up from the railway station and you can just sit out there, get yourself an Aperol or a cocktail, get yourself the antipasti and you get to have that sort of the high cuisine, haute cuisine food and the drink for 9.50. It's a great deal. This is the Church of the Holy Thorn, which was 
built as a place to house a relic which came back from the Crusades which was purported to be a spine from Christ's crown of thorns. Uh, I actually think it's one of the most beautiful buildings in Italy. Uh, it's, it's exquisite. Generally speaking it goes under the radar. Here's a lovely little piazza that you should come to. It's uh, called Piazza dei Cavalieri. It's got a lot of history behind it, right from the statue in the middle there, right in the most pompous place you could possibly put it, and that really is in keeping because it's a statue of a Medici. But behind that statue is another piece of the multi-layered history that you get in places like, like, like Pisa in Italy, and that is the Escuola uh, Normale Superiore which is a university. It's set up by Napoleon Bonaparte as a, as a sort of a, a sister to the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. This one in the corner has got an interesting legend to it in that there was a, a count who lived in this one and he was uh, in one of the many political comings and goings of the region. He was deemed to be a traitor and was set, he and his family were set in that house under house arrest but, but the legend is that they actually well they ended up eating each other <laughs> apparently they became cannibals and went completely mad because they couldn't get outside of the house so a little bit of the dark history then of of pizza and now it's, i think it's time we had the gelato conversation <laughs> yeah there's a couple of things you need to know about ordering gelato or even choosing where to get gelato in Italy well the first thing is it's not ice cream that's in the name basically there's no cream in gelato gelato is made from milk and the thing about cream is it's got a high fat content and it kind of holds together when it's whipped it holds together a little bit you know it gets quite stiff if it's whipped you've seen whipped cream milk doesn't do that so gelato has to stay uh, has to stay quite iced yeah. To, to hold its structure and it immediately when you get a gelato, a proper gelato, it will start to melt and you'll notice that immediately. So that's the first thing to notice. Secondly is uh, forget about choice, forget about choice paralysis and the usual sort of uh, North American way of thinking that, you know, more, more options is, is good. No, in a gelato shop, in a gelateria, they should be making the gelato the, the very day you eat it or possibly the day before you eat it and to do that effectively you can't have hundreds of flavors you've got to have you know maybe eight ten twelve flavors maximum uh, a good rule of thumb okay a good way to know whether you're in a proper gelateria or whether you're in some nasty tourist spot is well basically can you see the ice creams ideally can you see the gelato Ideally you can't, ideally they're going to actually be under covers because they need to be at really cold temperatures to hold that, uh, to hold that structure. So ideally they're not out uh, in those sort of display cases where you can see them all. If you can see them, go and find out if they have a pistachio. If they have a pistachio flavor, go and have a look at it. Is it green? When pistachio gets exposed to uh, oxygen in the atmosphere, it will go brown. So have a look and see, is the pistachio a sort of a bright artificial green? If it is, avoid. If it's a brown, that's a good sign. That means it's probably made properly and it means it's been made without preservatives, it's been made without artificial colorings and it's a pretty good sign. Thank you. It's already melting so I'm going to start eating it. It's exceptionally good gelato and I do urge you to come and try it because it, it's a little bit more expensive. One cone was three euros twenty so you can do you can get cheaper than that certainly you can get ice creams for two or even two fifty but don't miss the opportunity to get one a really really good one because I can't leave Tuscany without going to a steakhouse. I mean one called El Bottego de Parco here in, um, in Pisa right now. They make a big deal in Florence about their Florentine steaks and how they're grass fed and have a marble in the fat marbles through the flesh of the meat so that it's, it's really juicy and very flavorful and that's absolutely quite right but in, in Florence where the, where the brand is basically more established Florentine beef 
who pay 80 euros a kilo to have it cooked and brought to a table like this here in Pisa, the very same stuff is 40 euros a kilo. I do think maybe there's a good argument to the idea of taking your Tuscany trip and using Pisa as your base. Maybe going into Florence, which is only like 30 minutes away on the fast train, going to Florence for a day trip. Maybe that's the trick here. Maybe that's what the young tourist approach to Florence actually is, or the young tourist approach to Tuscany actually is, is stay in Pisa, use it as a base.